from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Predictions are all the rage at this time of year. Now on December 29th, 2020, in collaboration with Eric Porter Bradley of Enterprise Technology Research, ETR, we put forth our predictions for 2021 and the focus of our prognostications included tech spending, remote work, productivity apps, cybersecurity, IPOs, SPACs, M&A, data architecture, cloud, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, AI, containers, automation, and semiconductors. We covered a lot of ground. Now over the past several weeks, we've been inundated with literally thousands of inbound emails pitching us on various predictions and trends in these and other areas. Here's my predictions folder. And this is only a portion of the documents that I've received by email, obviously printed them out, killed a few trees, sorry. Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we're going to review briefly each of our predictions for this past year, 2021, and suggest a grade as to how we did. We're going to do this as a little warm up for our 2022 predictions, which we'll be doing in the next, over the next couple of weeks. Now, before we dig in, I want to make an observation. Many of the predictions that we received, they were observations of trends and sometimes not really predictions or, you know, or uh, not surprising, we got a lot of self-serving marketing statements. You know, predictions in our view, they should be measurable. So you can look back and say, okay, did they get it right? Now, granted there are gray areas. So that's why we'll use a grading system today. Now there are also many really well done and thought provoking predictions. And this is an example of one that we received that is strong. It's from Equinix CIO, uh, Milan Wagley, who said within the decade, data centers will be powered by 100% renewable energy. Okay, so you know, that's clear and we can measure that. But anyway, thanks to all the PR folks who sent along, like I said, literally thousands of predictions. We tried to read them all, but the volume over the past week or so was just so overwhelming. And we'll try to scan them before we do our 2022 predictions. But today we want to do that warm up by evaluating how we did in 2021. So let's get started. Our first prediction was the tech spending would increase by 4% this year, coming off of what we had thought was a contraction in 2020. And depending on which data you look at, you know, best case maybe was flat. We definitely correctly called the continuation into 2022 of the remote work trend and the positive impact it would have on PCs and the like, but we underestimated the shape of that rebound, that, that spend back curve. IDC has tech spending growth this year at five and a half percent. So we feel like while we called the bounce back, it was more pronounced than we had thought. In fact, you know, we think that IDC number is probably going to go up even higher and we'll address that in our 2022 prediction. So, so we'll give ourselves a B minus here. Okay, next prediction was remote worker trends become fossilized, settling in at an average of 34% by year end 2021. So on average, 34% of the workers would be remote by the end of this year. Now, you know, we made the call, but we missed Delta. You know, we missed uh, Omicron. We said 34% remote, which would be 2X the historical norms. Now the ETR data suggests it was 52% in September, and it's probably going to be somewhere in the 40 to 45% range uh, by, by the end of this month, end of December. And you know, the thing is 75% of the workforce is probably still working either fully remote or in a hybrid model. And hybrid work is probably going to be the dominant trend. And we're going to have to revisit that framework or how we think about this whole structure. And we'll do that again in our 2022 predictions. So we'll give ourselves a C on that one. We'll take some credit for the permanence of the trend, but the percentage was well off the mark, you know, thanks to the variance, as well as some cultural shifts, that whole hybrid notion. Okay, so, hey, not really a great start for Eric and me, but we rebound with the next one. The productivity increases we said seen in 2020 will lead organizations to double down on the successes and certain productivity apps will benefit. So to measure this, we said, let's take a look at the most recent quarterly earnings and gauge the revenue growth year on year as an indicator. DocuSign was up 42%, Smartsheet, who we also called up, was up 46% in revenue. 
Twilio up 65%. Zoom growth was 35% down from 325%, confirming our layup call that Zoom growth would moderate. It had nowhere to go but down. And Microsoft Teams has never been more ubiquitous, has never seen greater adoption with hundreds of companies having 100,000 or more users and thousands of companies with 10,000 users or more. So we really feel like we nailed this one. So we're going give to us, give ourselves an A+. Plus. Okay, so now on to cyber. It's an area that we've been making calls in for a couple of years now. And we're really pleased looking back here. We, we said permanent shifts in CISO strategies are going to lead to share shifts in network security. Now, we said to give you more detail, maybe that sounds like an easy one, but we said specifically identity, cloud security and endpoint security would continue to benefit. And we specifically named CrowdStrike, Okta, Zscaler and a few others kind of targeting their growth rates. Now Gartner has the security market growing at 11%. Okta and Zscaler revenues last quarter grew at 62% year over year. CrowdStrike 63%. Illumio, who we also called out, they raised $225 million on a $2.75 billion valuation on the strength of its growth. That was in September. Now Akamai acquired GuardioCore for $600 million, another company we called out. That they, would do it, they did that as a ransomware protection play and they paid a huge revenue multiple for the company. And it seems the guys listed on the last line are all talking about subscriptions, SaaS, ARR, remaining performance obligations or RPO. So we feel very good about this look back. We'll take an A on this one. No, it's not an A plus because we were too conservative on the growth of Okta, CrowdStrike and Zscaler topping at 50%. They, they blew that away by another 10 points or so, 10 to 15. But look, pretty good call nonetheless. Okay, again, the next one you might feel like is a layup but not really. So we said the increased tech spend would drive even more IPOs, SPACs, and M&A. According to SPAC analytics, IPOs were up 109% this year. The SPAC attack continued up 109% in 2021 on top of a record 2020. And according to KPMG, M&A dollar volume was up 19%. Okay, you might say, ah, that was an easy call. But there was much more underneath this prediction. We called out UiPath IPO, which was a lock, but also said Automation Anywhere would go public. UiPath did, AA didn't. We did correctly call the HashiCorp IPO. We said they'd either get, go IPO or get acquired. And Cloudflare grew revenue 219% last quarter, but Akamai was not acquired. So the degree of difficulty on the overall prediction wasn't high, but the Automation Anywhere and Akamai events, we made those calls that didn't happen. And those were you know, obviously tougher calls. So we think this still deserves a B grade. All right, as you know, data is one of our favorite subjects and we've reported extensively on the successes and failures of so-called big data. We said next in the next prediction that in the 2020s, 75% of large organizations will re-architect their big data platforms. And we said this would occur you know, in earnest over the next four to five years. Now, again, you may say, duh, Dave, but you have to evaluate the prediction based on the underlying comments here. The jury is still out on things like Snowflake's data cloud, but we absolutely believe that it's the right direction. But then you have, then you have Databricks coming in, taking a different approach. They're coming at the problem from a data science angle, trying to take on traditional BI. And then you got Snowflake coming from the analytics space and moving into AI and data science. And you know, we asked at AWS, AWS reInvent, we asked Benoit Dajaville on theCUBE if there needs to be a semantic layer to bring these two worlds together. And he said, yes. And that's what he claims Snowflake is building. Meanwhile, you got the big whales like Oracle, they continue to invest in their capabilities to try to eliminate data movement. And then there's AWS taking a totally different approach to data where it gives customers maximum optionality of offerings and database and other services. And you can't forget Microsoft and Google. So many customers might not take the steps that we predicted because they're comfortable where they are. And specifically, we're talking about here, a shift toward domain ownership and data product thinking and the reorganization of hyper-specialized technical teams. Many of the principles put forth by data mesh. And we've said this change is going to take 
a number of years to play out, four to five years. So we start noticing in 2021 that that's clearly been the case as we reported on parts of JP Morgan Chase, uh, uh, rethinking its data architecture, HelloFresh and many others. So this is still an incomplete. The professor will give ourselves an incomplete on this one, but we think it's trending in the right direction. Okay, the next one is always a fun discussion. That's the battle to define hybrid and multi-cloud. We said that's going to escalate in 2021 and will create bifurcated CIO strategies. Now, here we go. AWS sees the world as bringing its APIs and primitives and model to the edge. And the data center to AWS is just another edge node. And the company says that in still believes in the fullness of time that all data will be in the cloud, however that's defined. And AWS, AWS would say all this talk about hybrid of connecting on-prem to a cloud, they would flat out say, Adam Salipsky told us this, that's not cloud is what he said. Then on the other side of the table, you have the likes of Cisco, Dell, HPE, et cetera, saying, hold on, cloud is an operating model. It's not a place. And AWS might say, yeah, and AWS, along with its customers, is defining that operating model. And these other guys would say, no, actually, you're not. We are with our customers. And this battle 100% escalated in 2021 with the launch of Apex by Dell, HPE doubled down on GreenLake, Cisco's as a service models. And then of course, Oracle, which actually announced a true same, same public to on-prem hybrid capability two years before AWS announced Outpost. And of course, Oracle's executing on that strategy in earnest in 2021. And the other nuance here is a concept that we introduced called super cloud, which refers to the notion that Look, something like, for example, multi-cloud is not about running within a respective cloud. It's not about cloud compatibility. Rather, it's about abstracting the complexity of the underlying cloud primitives and building value on top of those cloud services, on top of the investments in CapEx that the hyperscalers have made. Now, some people didn't like the term super cloud. Maybe Uber cloud would be a better term. We're going to continue to use it to describe this capability. We think it has meaning. And we're seeing new examples like Goldman Sachs' financial cloud running on top of AWS. So a super cloud is not a, an application or a suite of applications running on a single cloud. Now, if those applications span multiple clouds like, like Snowflake is trying to do, okay, that's a service. It could span multiple clouds or in the case of Goldman Sachs, it's a portfolio of data, tools, and software that's made accessible as a service that floats on top of a single or even multiple clouds, regardless. We feel that this was a correct call given the evidence and we'll give ourselves an A minus taking points off for the somewhat anecdotal and observational measurement system that we apply to look back at this prediction. Okay, the next prediction was we made was cloud containers, AI and ML automation uh, are going to power that those big four are going to power 2021 spending. Here's a graphic we use to predict that. It plots survey data for the various technologies within the ETR taxonomy, net score or spending momentum on the vertical axis and market share or presence in the data set. It's a pervasive measurement on the horizontal axis. The one that matters here is the vertical, that dotted line of 40%. Anything above that is considered highly elevated. And these four areas have held serve this year based on recent ETR survey data that we're not showing here. We'll, we'll bring that into our 2022 prediction. So this prediction came in correctly per the most recent survey data. And that's our measurement system on this one. So we're going to take an A for this one too. Now on the penultim penultimate prediction, here we came back to automation saying that aut the automation mandate accelerates in 2021. UiPath and Automation Anywhere we said would go public, but Microsoft remains a threat to these pure play RPA vendors. Well. We gave ourselves a B on this one, doubling down on automation anywhere, going public, you know, that was wrong. But we definitely saw this year companies leaning hard into automation. And Microsoft, despite the fact that it doesn't have as feature rich uh, a product and offering as UiPath and automation anywhere, Microsoft remains a very large presence. You know, we spoke to a lot of customers at the UiPath Forward 4 event in October in Las Vegas, physical event, and they confirmed you know, this is true, but at the same time, so they're using Power Automate from Microsoft, but also using, in this case, UiPath. So 
they've kind of confirmed that, yeah, it's not the same. We use that for some of our productivity. We're, we're an Azure customer, it's easy for us, but they're still leaning heavily and investing heavily into UiPath. And I think the same can be, be said for automation anywhere. But, autom but Power Automate shows up as a big time leader in the Magic Gartner Magic Quadrant, so it can't be ignored. But clearly the two leaders in RPA have a sizable product advantage relative to the legacy software players. Now, if you look at the comment on Pegasystems, they cooled off a bit as measured by their stock price. Their revenue grew 13% last quarter on a year on year basis, but perhaps we overestimated the tailwind effect and the company's momentum. So we'll take a B on this prediction. Correct call on the automation trend and the big software vendors piling in, uh, IBM, et cetera. But the chance we took on automation <laughs> anywhere again was a miss. So we'll ding ourselves on that. And our last prediction for 2021 was 5G rollouts push new edge IoT workloads and necessitate new system architectures. Now, much of this prediction you can see in the underlying bullets here, really related to the observation that ARM was dominating at the edge. It would find its way into the mainstream enterprise workloads. And we've been asking a lot of the mainstream you know, companies, the OEMs, you know, what do you, what do you see with, with ARM in the enterprise? And they say, ah, we don't see it yet. But very clearly this came into focus in 2021 as AWS announced Graviton 3 now, and new inference and new training silicon. These are different types of workloads that are emerging in the enterprise. These are all based on ARM. Microsoft, Google, Alibaba, Oracle, and others are now shipping or readying ARM-based systems for the enterprise. When you look at new storage, network, and security appliances and other systems, they're very often, often including ARM-based processors to assist with the offloads. And look, Intel is definitely under, predict, under pressure as we've predicted many times, not just in our predictions post. Even Pat Gelsinger has admitted, this is a turnaround, it's going to take at least five years. That's kind of new and recent data that, that he's made public. So we're going to take an A minus on this one. We're going to take off some points for the fact that, you know, 5G rollouts and edge are evolving and this is a longer term trend. But the underlying points that we made on this slide are still pretty solid. Now, if we use the following scale where A plus is 100 out of 100, A minus is a 90, a B is an 85, a B minus is an 80, and a C is a 75 out of 100, and we exclude that incomplete prediction on data architectures, we average out to an 87.8, so that's a solid B plus. And so the professor in us said, hey, a little yellow sticky, good effort, as most of the predictions could be quantified and or you know, we tried to object objectively score them. There were some layups in there. So yeah, maybe we'll try to take more risks, uh, you know, or not, you know, we, we, we will see. We like winning. And so, you know, you always have to couch some of these things with some obvious ones, but, but really try to give some detail underneath that's maybe non-obvious. Um, and we'll try to keep it down, you know, like we did this year to one or two multi-year predictions. So what's next? Well, Eric Bradley and I were working on our 2022 predictions. We're going to release those in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. You know, what do you think? How did we do? You know, we're grading ourselves here. Love to know, you know, if we're, we're off base, on base, were we too hard on ourselves, too easy? Give us your feedback. Don't forget these episodes, they're all available as podcasts. Wherever you listen, all you got to do is search Breaking Analysis Podcast. Check out ETR's website at etr.plus. Remember, we also publish a full report every week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. You can always get in touch with email, david.vellante at siliconangle.com. You can DM me at dvellante or comment on our LinkedIn posts. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE Insights, powered by ETR. Have a great week, everybody. Stay safe, be well, and we'll see you next time.